Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our seminar this afternoon. We are having the seminar because of incidences that have happened in our sister institutions and we want to make sure that we're prepared. And um, we have speaking to us today is our Chief of Police, Ernie Ellis, and with him is T.J. Geary and Al Alicia Leakett, and they will be talking about what we are to do in situations that we hope will never happen, but in case there is an active shooter, what are we to do? How, to, are we, how shall we handle ourselves in that situation? I would like to ask you on behalf of the Center for Teaching Excellence, who is co-sponsoring this particular seminar, to please fill out your evaluation forms. And those of you online, if you would please fill out the online evaluation form. So I'd like to now turn it over to Ernie Ellis. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Uh, I also would like to welcome each of you and thank you for your interest and participation today. Uh, safety is a community project. We're all responsible in some way for making this a safe uh, community and campus. So your interest and your presence here today says a great deal to me. So thank you. Uh, the format we're going to use, I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes uh, about the overall emergency preparedness plan for the university. Uh, I'll then turn it over to TJ, who will talk to you about the topic of active shooter. And then Elisa will come up and talk to you a bit about BIT, the Behavioral Intervention Team. Uh, the University of South Carolina, uh, in my opinion, is in a very good place as far as emergency plans and emergency response. Uh, the administration here, under the guidance of President Sorensen, uh, directed over two years ago uh, that the emergency plan be brought up to date uh, and that those people who participate in that plan meet on a regular basis to maintain uh, the status of the plan and to prepare for emergencies that may arise. Uh, the heart of that team is the senior administration of the university, uh, including all the vice presidents, the provost, secretary to the board of trustees, uh, and we meet at least once a month and discuss issues relative to emergency preparedness. Uh, we'll be doing tabletop exercises. Uh, we'll be continuing to massage the plan. It's, it's a, a document that is actually never finished. It's always a work in progress, thank goodness. Uh, and then we'll move into a full-scale exercise, perhaps this fall or, or next spring. So you'll be hearing of some of these things and, and uh, uh, seeing how the university is preparing. Several things that have been of interest now, uh, one of them is emergency notification. Uh, when tragedy strikes, such as Virginia Tech or in Illinois, uh, how do we get the word out? Uh, as part of this process over the last several years, the university has researched and purchased an emergency notification system. Now, this system will reach out to you by text message, by voice, by email. Uh, they'll be installing crawlers on the university television network. Uh, and thanks to the hard work of Tom Seifert, who, who wrote a grant for the university, we'll also be getting an outdoor uh, public address system uh, that is capable of tone and voice message. Is that right, Tom? Yes. Thank you. We appreciate all your hard work. And I think the timetable is hopefully by April that'll be in? April 30th. April 30th. We're going to take it right up to the line. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, in order to participate in the emergency notification process, it's necessary for you to enroll. You need to go to VIP, make sure that you fill in all those areas with your email, with your uh, cell phone number, uh, home phone number, who your service provider is, etc. So that if the system is activated, you'll be receiving that information. Uh, another step that the university is taking to, to enhance security around campus is an enhanced outdoor video network. Uh, through the spring and, and perhaps even into the fall, uh, we'll be installing video cameras in the high traffic areas uh, on the outside of the buildings around campus. Uh, right now our plan calls for probably in the neighborhood of 50 cameras uh, through the core of campus and, and to other high traffic areas. Uh, these cameras are the equivalency of probably about adding 200 officers to our staff. Uh, these cameras will be monitored, uh, but they will be monitored using a process if we've got any good computer people in here, video analytics, uh, which will allow this system to continually monitor a space but only show us a picture when there's a problem, okay? Uh, it's very complex, but it's, it's very state-of-the-art. 
Uh, we'll be thrilled to get the system installed and it, it, it will be a tremendous enhancement. Uh, we are also moving forward in the areas of training. Times like today with TJ with us, uh, we have staff that's available at your request to come to groups, uh, talk on matters of regular community safety. We have a full-time crime prevention uh, and community relations officer. Uh, he can address your needs. I think Tom and environmental health and safety has uh, fire safety and other speakers available. Uh, so please know that these resources are there and call upon us at any time. I'm going to call on TJ now. Uh, we're very fortunate to have TJ as part of our staff. We stole him about a uh, year and a half, two years ago, I think. Uh, TJ brings uh, better than seven years of experience to our agency. Uh, a great deal of that experience is in SWAT training, hostage negotiations, and uh, he has broadened his uh, experience with us uh, to include active shooter. TJ will be coordinating a statewide exercise this summer in June uh, which is a training exercise on the topic of active shooters. So he's been, been very involved in our state in uh, developing these plans and, and these courses. TJ? All right. I'd like to thank everybody for the, uh, the opportunity to speak to you, and uh, thanks to the Director Ellis for the kind words. Um, I, I prepared a little PowerPoint, but um, this will be somewhat informal. If, um, if you've got questions or want me to uh, maybe hone in on something, uh, just, just let me know. Um, if we could go ahead and bring up the PowerPoint. We, um, could we bring the sound up? There should be sound associated with it. Yeah, we'll go without the sound. Uh, <laughs> the sound was actually the, uh, the radio transmissions from um, the North Hollywood bank robbery shooting that I'm sure you all have seen clips or uh, saw in the news several years back. Um, that was one of probably the more severe active shooting type incidents, of course. The difference uh, with that incident was the fact that, that uh, most of the victims and the, the target of, of the suspects were police rather than um, students or uh, people in a store or restaurant like, uh, like most we see. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of touch on some of the, the historical incidents that we've seen and um, each, uh, each incident has uh, some teaching points and some things that we've learned from, from each of them that we can use to prepare ourselves today. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about is the University of Texas at Austin. This was kind of the original active shooter um, as far as the school setting goes. Um, Charles Whitman uh, was a student at the University of Texas. Um, several things led up to, to the actual shooting. Um, many of you remember this is the, the Texas sniper. Um, is, is how it was kind of coined in the, in the new, uh, news. Um, he was a student at the University of Texas. Um, he had some, some history of mental illness, some depression. Um, the, uh, he had former military training, so he was, he was very skilled uh, with weapons, very knowledgeable. Um, some things that kind of led up to it. Uh, the night before the actual shooting, he murdered his mother and he murdered his wife. And this was thought it to be sort of his, uh, his mental break. Um, he slept in the house and then, and then packed his stuff and came to the uh, school the next day. Uh, he was armed with three rifles, two handguns, and a shotgun. And he went atop this tower. Um, the University of Texas has a, has a large tower in the middle of campus, um, several stories high, that, that gives a, a good view of the whole campus. Um, he, uh, once he got up there, he set up a, a position and basically started utilizing sniper tactics against the people down below. Um, he began shooting just indiscriminately. He didn't have uh, preconceived targets. He just shot at whoever, whoever presented themselves. Um, the police responded, uh, had not really faced this type of incident before. Uh, when they would try to advance on the tower, he would hold them at bay because he had a 360 degree view of um, anyone who tried to approach the tower. With, um, with the help of some citizens who were quickly deputized, who had kind of shown up to help, um, state police and local police um, set up a plan. They were able to 
set up a, a bit of a diversion on one side, which allowed some, some other officers to, to come around to his flank and get up the tower. Um, once they got up to the top of the tower, there was a, a brief gunfight and the shooter was killed. Um, this was several years ago, back in the 60s. Um, we had kind of a lull in active shooters um, after that. The University of Iowa back in the 90s um, had an incident. Uh, Gang Lu was a former student. He had just finished his uh, doctoral degree there. Um, he was disappointed that he did not win a, a prestigious award for his dissertation. Um, so he came back after having uh, finished his coursework there and uh, murdered several people in his department. Uh, he was a, a physics and astronomy student. Um, he killed the department chair, he killed uh, his academic advisor, um, several graduate students, and I think another faculty member. Um, he came armed with two handguns. Um, at the end of the, the incident, he killed himself. Um, this was, was pre-Columbine, and while it was in the news at the time, it, it, it wasn't enough to really push, um, push law enforcement and push uh, institutions to, to kind of change their way of, of doing business. Columbine, which of course everyone has heard about, um, that is where, where active shooter, the, the term active shooter and the, the concept of, of rapid deployment to an active shooter was really, um, was really invented more or less. Uh, up to this time, and including Columbine, um, <clears throat> police were taught to, if they responded to a shooting, they set up a perimeter and they basically kept the, the shooter in there, kept him from moving or escaping, and they called out SWAT. Um, when SWAT arrived, they, um, they were well, well armed with rifles and had extra, extra protection and Kevlar helmets and uh, higher levels of body armor. They were uh, highly trained in entry tactics, and they went in and dealt with the shooter. Um, it was with Columbine that people finally realized that that was not how you dealt with an active shooter. Um, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were, uh, were students at Columbine High School, and um, they had certainly some, some mental health issues, and uh, there were some issues of, of bullying, and a lot of issues that kind of contributed to, to the situation. Um, they uh, pre-planned the event pretty far in advance, got some assistance in purchasing the weapons that they were not able to purchase themselves. Um, they made some uh, improvised explosive devices and uh, packed those and brought them with uh, them to the school. Uh, they were armed with a carbine rifle, two shotguns, um, two handguns, and almost 100 IEDs, which they set up throughout the school uh, during their, during their uh, attack. Um, they were briefly engaged by the police whenever they, they first started their, their attack. What they did, and this was all part of their plan, was they set up a diversionary fire. Um, they actually set off an explosive about a half mile from the school, which caused a small fire. And that was actually the initial call that the police responded to, was that there was some kind of explosion or fire near the school. An officer went to check it out, and um, it was he had no idea really what he was getting into. Um, and that's one of the important learning points that, um, that we'll talk about again in a minute, is that often these, these don't start off as active shooters. You know, when we get the 911 call, we're not going to get a 911 call that there is an active shooter at, at this place. It's going to be, it may be gunfire, it may be an explosion, it may be, you know, some type of disturbance, loud noise, people running from a building, maybe an alarm going off. But you just need to keep an open mind whenever something out of the ordinary goes on because it may be more than more than what you realize. Um, the police realized once they got there what was going on and a police officer briefly engaged the suspects outside one of the buildings as they were making their entry. Um, he took fire back and took cover. Uh, they, they were in the building at that point. Um, once they were in the building he called for backup and they set up a perimeter. Several agencies responded from the city, the county, the state, and it really was not that much of a delay from the, the point of the first call to the, the first entry. What they did, though, was they waited for SWAT team members to arrive, and they kind of made a ragtag SWAT team out of, you know, a couple people from this agency, a couple people from this agency, and as soon as they had a few, they went in. Um, but the delay by that point was, was up to about 40 or 45 minutes. Once they, 
they entered the uh, the building, they they heard the the last shot, and that was actually the suspects committed suicide. What you'll see as a as a pattern in these active shooters is that the suspect will will typically continue to um, to kill or shoot people until they are either killed or until they are confronted with with the the choice of killing themselves or being captured. Um, at the end of the day, 13 dead and there were 24 wounded. That brings us to Virginia Tech, which is really um, what pushed us to the point that we're at now here at the university. Um, we, um, back in January of last year, actually began our active shooter preparations. Um, of course, once uh, the shootings at Virginia Tech occurred, that, that really provided the, the stimulus to, to push us into overdrive. Um, to the point that, that we are now at our the, the level of preparedness we now have. Um, at Virginia Tech, um, once again, it was a student. Uh, he was armed with two handguns and several magazines. Um, he had a very well-planned, uh, well-orchestrated um, attack going into it. Um, the media has, has presented some things and uh, parts of it are somewhat skewed and just to kind of give you what actually happened at Virginia Tech. Um, there were initial shootings. Um, that was the, the two initial victims. It was a, a student and an RA. Um, at that point, the police responded to um, what was called in as someone possibly falling out of their bed. That was, that's the second example of you know, when, you, when something's going on, it may not be what you think it is. Um, they responded and found that there had been a murder. Um, at that point, there was some reason to believe that the victim's boyfriend was actually the last person to be seen with her and that he was possibly uh, the perpetrator. Um, having worked investigations at the sheriff's office that I came from and having worked extensively in the areas of domestic violence, um, if there's a female murdered, the suspect is usually going to be, the, the initial suspect is usually going to be a boyfriend or a husband because that's who is statistically most likely to kill a, a female. Um, that's, the, that's the path that they, they, their investigation took. Um, they began trying to locate this boyfriend who was now a person of interest in this, in this initial murder. Um, Virginia Tech, which had a full SWAT team, and uh, Blacksburg PD, which is the, the jurisdiction surrounding the college, um, activated their SWAT team also. So you had now two, two full SWAT teams activated and they were out searching for this person of interest. Um, he was located by um, a patrol officer or a trooper and, um, and detained. Investigators swooped down to begin questioning him, and while they were actually beginning to question uh, the person they believed was responsible for the initial murders, the, the second attack took place. Um, they were faulted for, for not notifying, uh, not having uh, some type of emergency alert system to, to notify their students that uh, the that there was a murder and that there was a possible shooter on the loose. Uh, the information that they had was that the shooter had left campus, at least the person they believed to be the shooter, um, which is, is how they, um, that's the, the reason they have given for, for not having notified. Um, I think looking back, if they had to do it all over again, of course they would, they would do an, an alert. However, you can't really judge the first case of anything, and this is really this was really a unique set of events. Um, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and you know, if, if we were in that position at that time, I doubt many schools across the country would have done things differently. But when the second attack uh, occurred, uh, Cho went into the building. He actually stuck his head in a few doors and um, began kind of getting his bearings and, and making his plan. Um, he brought a chain and some locks and actually chained one of the doors shut. Um, this would come into play later whenever the police actually responded. Um, it, would, it would inhibit them getting into the building. <coughs> the, um, the key factor is that when the call came in for the second shooting, they now had two SWAT teams, full, two full SWAT teams already activated. Typically, if you call a SWAT team out, you're looking at you know, 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes response time because most jurisdictions don't have a SWAT team sitting there waiting to respond somewhere. You're going to be calling in patrol officers and investigators and people who make up the SWAT team who have full-time jobs at the police department. They're going to you know, gear up, get their truck, and then respond. 
Um, so the fact that they had two SWAT teams just sitting there waiting to respond was, was very unique. Um, both SWAT teams responded immediately to the shooting. They had people there within minutes, maybe three or four minutes of the call for the second shooting. Um, their truck was on the way. Several members um, were already there. Uh, when they got there, they found several doors locked. Uh, like I said, Cho had actually locked and chained um, some of the doors to prevent victims from leaving and to prevent police from responding. Um, they attempted to, to breach those doors using um, a gun, which is all they had at the time to, to break in. Um, they were unsuccessful with those chain doors, but they continued to try doors until they found a, a regular locked door, which they were able to shoot through through the lock mechanism of that door and, and force entry. Um, at this point, the, the shooting was continuing as he went uh, down the halls on his rampage. Um, the officers actually heard what would be the last shots, and that turned out to be the, the suspect committing suicide. Um, it is certainly reasonable to believe that he heard the, the forced entry being made downstairs and that was what, you know, if, you, if he felt that he was cornered, you know, rather than be, be taken into custody, he chose to kill himself. Um, Northern Illinois University is, is the most recent case that uh, we've had on a college campus of, uh, of a mass killing. Um, a former student, um, whereas Cho had a very long history of mental illness and, and several uh, kind of pre-incident indicators that, that he may have been trouble. Um, Stephen at uh, NIU was a little different. He was a good student by the, by the college's admission. He made good grades. He was an officer in a couple of student organizations. He was very involved in, in various programs at the school. Um, he had actually gone to grad school and was studying somewhere else after having left NIU. Um, but again, there was there was some history of, of mental illness with some depression, and he had some uh, a, a turbulent relationship with his girlfriend. That that's, um, there was some evidence of that. But at the same time, he didn't really fit what people um, would think as a, a stereotypical school shooter. Um, and what we found is that there really is no profile. It's very hard to predict who, who will do something. There are a lot of false positives. Um, things that you can identify as being present in several school shootings you have in, in many students. So the presence of them does not necessarily indicate a school shooter. It's just that when you have a school shooter, you turn around and you see those indicators present. Um, he was armed with three handguns and a shotgun. Um, his uh, attack also was well planned. Um, at the end of the day, there were six dead and 16 wounded. Um, NIU had trained for an active shooter incident, and they had a plan in place to, to respond to such a case. Um, they responded and actually had um, officers on scene within 30 to 45 seconds of the first call. Um, unfortunately, the time between the shooting occurring or starting and the first call, you know, there was a lag time of maybe a minute, and it really doesn't take a long time to uh, go on a rampage whenever you're facing unarmed victims. So, unfortunately, that time was enough time to him uh, for him to kill six and wound 16. Um, question is, what is an active shooter? What makes an active shooter different from some other type of criminal? Um, an active shooter is one or more subjects who participate in a random or a systematic shooting spree demonstrating their intent to continuously harm others. Their overriding objective appears to be mass murder rather than other criminal conduct. Um, the key is that it can be random or systematic. There have been active shooters who, who have a so-called hit list where they're looking for specific victims who have wronged them in some way. You have people who are content to just kill people and, and they, don't, they don't care who they kill. They're just going to, to try to inflict as much carnage as possible. Um, the other key is that their objective is to kill people. Um, they're not going there to rob people. They're not there to sexually assault people. They're there to kill people. Um, and the key is that they're going to continue to do so until something causes them to either refocus their attention or to, to stop. Um, the um, law enforcement response, um, you know, we've developed tactics to respond to an active shooter because an active shooter is very different from any other call that we get.
Um, a concept called rapid response or rapid deployment has been developed, um, and this is how we, how we deal with active shooters. Um, it's the swift and immediate deployment of law enforcement resources to ongoing life-threatening situations where delayed deployment could otherwise result in death or great bodily harm to innocent persons. In other words, the old days um, of set up a perimeter, keep everybody contained, and call for SWAT, those, those days are over. And we've kind of shifted into a new paradigm where the, the first responding officers, whether it's a patrol officer or an investigator or whoever gets there first, um, they're going to they're gonna form a, a small entry team. You know, so the first probably three officers who are on scene, they're going to be, they're going to take the role of that SWAT team and they're going to go in themselves and, and find the shooter and stop the shooter. <clears throat> Law enforcement's number one priority is to contain and neutralize the shooter. Um, oftentimes when, when something of this uh, magnitude occurs and people are hurt and shot and police respond, the first thing the victims want to do is, is seek comfort from the police officers. Um, our officers are not trained to um, stop and render first aid. They're not um, taught to stop and console the victim in these type of cases because for every second that they delay engaging that shooter, you do no benefit to the to the victim who is already shot, and you do nothing but allow him to, to find new victims. So our officers are trained to to bypass victims. If someone tries to impede their progress, they're going to push them out of the way, and they're going to they're on a seek and destroy mission. They're looking for the shooter, and they're going to do whatever it takes to stop that shooter. Um, specifically, uh, the University of South Carolina. Our response um, to the active shooter threat has been to train and certify two of our officers as active shooter instructors. Um, I'm one of them, and uh, Wayne Freeman, our emergency preparedness coordinator, is our other active shooter instructor. Um, what we have done is come back and put together classes for, for our officers. 100% um, of our officers, with the exception of, of a couple of newly hired officers who haven't undergone all their training yet, um, are trained in active shooter tactics. So all of our patrol officers, all of our investigators, our victim advocate, uh, you know, if, if you work for us and you carry a gun, then you've been trained in active shooter tactics. Um, and the idea is that everybody needs to be prepared for this type of situation because it could, you know, it may not be a patrol officer who's the first one, two, or three on scene. So um, all of our officers have been trained in active shooter tactics. Um, in addition, we've uh, added a component to our annual in-service training that we do each year to uh, maintain our certification to where we update um, our officers' training with, with whatever the newest tactics are, with whatever, um, whatever has occurred since their last training that may have been improved upon. Um, we provide that training also. Um, as Director Ellis stated, we, uh, we're going to be hosting um, an active shooter training class. It's a, an instructor level class. Um, here at the university, and we're going to be the will be the sole South Carolina site for this this national training. Uh, the training is called Alert. It's um, Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. It's uh, sponsored through the Department of Homeland Security, and they do it throughout the country. And um, we were fortunate enough to uh, be chosen as the as the host site. So we'll be certifying four of our officers as instructors through their program. Um, and hopefully picking up some, some new tactics and stuff that maybe we uh, have not received yet. Um, but we'll be state, local, um, and university police from around the state and possibly from, from Georgia and North Carolina. Um, we'll be coming here and we'll be doing some, some practical exercises and, and training um, in June. Um, we can't tell you exactly how to respond to, from, from your perspective, to an active shooter. The reason is that every situation is different and every person's capabilities are different. So what we can do is kind of throw a lot of information out there to you and then it's up to you to kind of garner from that, you know, what would be the best um, plan for you. And, you know, it's something that you should give some thought to and, and kind of decide, you know, what, what would be best for you. Um, and how you respond is going to depend on, on what, what the shooter does, where, where you are, what type of classroom, what the layout is. Um, but we'll, we will provide you some tips. One thing to keep in mind is that there may be one shooter. There have been several incidents where um, there have been a team of shooters. So if you, if you get stuck in your head that this is the shooter and this is the threat, 
you may run right into the arms of, of another shooter. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Generally, if, if an active shooter is outside your building, the best course of action would be to pr proceed to a room that can be locked. Um, close, lock, and barricade all windows and doors. When we say barricade, you need to find whatever the heaviest piece of furniture is in the room that you can move and put it in front of the door. Um, some of the rooms don't lock so that you're going to be relying on this barricade to keep the shooter out. Um, most times the shooters are looking for the easy targets. So what you want to do is, um, there's a concept called target hardening. It's something that we use in crime prevention. You want to target harden your classroom. Um, so if you can move a bookshelf to, to block the door, the shooter is much more likely to go to the room that there is no obstruction than to try to push something heavy out of the way. So whatever you can get, you want to barricade that, uh, that door. You want to turn off the lights and get down, <clears throat> get down low, ensuring that you're not visible from the outside. Um, if he sees you in there, then, <clears throat> then you're a target. If he doesn't see you in there, then hopefully he'll move along to, um, to the next room. You want to silence all cellular phones and remain very quiet. You don't want to give any indication that, that there's somebody in there. Um, have one person in the room call 911 and let that person, if, if you were all in the same situation, then we're not going to get more information by having four of you call than have one of you call. But what you could do is, is kind of flood the, the dispatch center with, with calls while we're trying to get information from the first call. So if, there, you know, if you're 30 people in a room, then you want to designate somebody, okay, you call 911, and, and that person be responsible for relaying whatever, whatever information you can provide to the dispatchers. Um, do not unlock the door unless you are absolutely certain that it's the police outside. Um, if you hear, you know, police, it's okay, open up, that very well could be the shooter telling you to open up because he wants to get in there. If, if it's us and you don't open the door, then you're, you're no worse off than, than you would have been because, you know, we're not going to, you know, set the room on fire or anything like that to smoke you out. We're just going to, you know, we'll find a way in. So if, if you're in there, just stay in there. And if you don't, if you're not sure that it's us, then, then don't do it. You know, very similar to, you know, somebody tries to pull you over with blue lights and you don't think they're the police, don't pull over. If it's a um, situation where somebody's claiming to be the police outside, if you don't think they are, then don't. Um, if an active shooter is inside your building, you want to determine whether your room can be locked. And if so, then follow those previous instructions that we talked about um, on the last slide. If not, then determine if there's a nearby room that can be locked and whether it's safe to proceed there or if it's safe, safe to escape outside. One thing to keep in mind whenever you're, you're weighing your options about escaping to the outside is there has been um, one or two instances where the, the initial diversion was to get people outside because the shooters were set up on the outside. So just, just keep that in the back of your mind as you, as you escape outside. Um, if the shooter is in the building, then certainly outside is no, is no less safe. If an active shooter enters your actual office or your actual classroom, this is about as bad as things get. Um, try to remain calm. If possible, dial 911. If you can't speak, leave the line open and just allow the dispatcher to hear whatever comes over the phone. Um, if you're near a landline, a good option is to just <coughs> take the phone off the receiver, dial 911 and set it down because that call is going to go to the 911 operator and it will be traced right back to your room. Even if we have no idea what's going on there, we're going to send an officer because we've got a 911 call from there. So if at all possible, dial from a landline and we'll know exactly where you're located. If, if all you have is a cell phone, still try to dial 911. If you can't speak, just set the phone down and try to let the dispatcher at least get some information from, um, from what she hears over the phone. DJ, is, that, is it um, activated where we can dial 911 from our campus? Does that go to the main line or do we dial the 7? Dial 911. Um, you know, there's been some confusion as to what number goes to which dispatch center. The, the best course of action is dial 911. Um, if you dial 911 from anywhere on campus, that goes straight to us. If you dial 911 from a cell phone, um, it will go to the, the Columbia Central Dispatch, Police Dispatch, and as soon as they realize it's USC, they hit one button and it goes to our dispatcher. Um, but either way, you're going to get some help on the way. If the call gets disconnected and Columbia Dispatch gets a call from here, they're still going to notify us and we're still going to be on the way. 
Um, so we really encourage people just just remember 911 regardless of where you dial from or what type of phone it is. You don't have to dial 9 first. No. Okay. 911 from a campus phone will go to, go to us. Um, if you're unable to escape or hide, act within your abilities. Now, that's a very broad statement and it's intentionally broad because we don't know what your capabilities are. If, if you don't have any capabilities or you don't think you do, then don't do anything. Um, if you if you're in a situation where somebody's going down the line shooting everybody, then you you really you get to a point where you don't have anything to lose. Um, you don't want to do anything that would further jeopardize jeopardize your safety. However, if you're about to be killed, then you know your your safety is jeopardized. If the shooter leaves, you want to proceed to a safer location or lock and barricade behind him. <clears throat> yes. For that situation, the last. Uh, what about the idea of uh, recruiting students in your class beginning of a semester and getting you know, a group of large, strong guys who you uh, seek in a particular spot and ask them to be ready? Um, I can't recommend that. that. I mean, that's something that you're, they would be potentially putting themselves in harm's way obviously kind of taking one for the team. Um, if, if that's something they're willing to do, then, then you know, maybe that's, that's the course of action they, they should take. Um, I will say that there was an active shooting um, that was basically stopped by a student. Um, there was a high school shooting where the suspect was pinned by a high school wrestler who <laughs> felt that he was capable of taking the shooter out. And he was right. He took him and, you know, used his um, wrestling skills and his, his physical strength to basically hold the um, suspect down until the police arrived and you know he saved the day. Now conversely you know he could have been shot in the head on his way up to the shooter so that's really a personal a personal choice. Um, I would advise you to be careful about any kind of liability that you would assume by recruiting somebody to, to do that they're not you know may not be willing to do it already. Um, Yes. But shouldn't people, if you're, if you're in a room and there's an active shooter, shouldn't everybody just say, pick up anything that's heavy, throw it at him, just do anything to disturb the attack, rather than sort of wait for something to happen, or one-on-one -on -one go after the person? I mean, shouldn't that be like standard, if you're in a room, just pick things up, throw it at him, go towards the shooter, get the shooter out? I mean, that's what I would do. <laughs> um, but because you read, you, I, I read, you read about show. Right. And he walked in the room, he walked up and down, somebody was moving, he shot him again, he walked in right. the next room, came back, anybody, that they're all under their desks hiding, right. and they, he just walked in and shot him. Right. Um, like I said, we can't, we can't tell you that that's what you need to do, but if it were me, I would certainly fight back. If, if the choice is be killed, or possibly be killed while I fight back, I'd much rather at least have a fighting chance if, if the end result is, is going to be the same. Yes? You're probably going to have this on the screen, but how long can we expect once you get a 911 call if there's an active shooter in a building for you to be there? I mean, do you, you run tests or, um, you know, how do you deploy yourself on campus to make sure that you can be we at have a, a site? Right. We have a very fast response time as a, as a department. Um, it's because of the way that we, we deploy our staff and it's also because of um, the fact that we're a relatively small um, jurisdiction as far as, as land area. Um, you know, coming from the sheriff's office where you know you could potentially have two deputies running, you know, calls for half the county, you know, we have a shift of officers who, who basically are are here on this campus. Um, you can expect us very quickly, especially for, for a serious call. We usually get places pretty quickly for non serious calls. Um, I can tell you that if there's a shooting or or some type of um, active shooter or some type of incident like that, you're going to get everybody. I mean, you know, we, we run about up to eight officers per patrol shift, um, you know, but we've got probably two to three times that if you look at, you know, investigations, uh, training, administration, you know, we've got police officers who do non-patrol jobs. We have uh, police officers who work in records, who work in dispatch, who, um, you know, I do training, you know, our emergency management folks. Um, Investigators, the guys who do all the, the security cameras and alarms around the, the campus are all police officers. 
So you, know, you have a you have a, a pretty large force that would be responding to to something of this nature. Um, what to expect from us um, as far as when we respond to your situation? Responding officers, like I said, are trained to proceed immediately to the shooter. Um, depending on the circumstances, they may pass you by in an attempt to reach the shooter. Um, if you can direct them to the shooter, do so, but don't do anything to attempt to halt their movement. Um, they're going to keep going. You know, don't stand on the track if the train's coming. So, um, if you encounter the police, you want to keep your hands visible and follow all commands given. Um, what we're looking for when we come through is a threat. So you don't want to look like a threat. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that you may be told to get on the ground. You may be told to put your hands behind your back. You may be handcuffed. When we respond, we have no idea what what we're getting into. We may not even have a description of the shooter. Um, if if you are suspect, then then you may be detained until we figure out who who the bad guy is. Um, you don't want to resist any of that because we're going to be using whatever force is necessary. In the event of an actual tactical assault, meaning the shooter is in your room and here comes the cavalry through the door, um, the best thing to do is to fall to the floor. Cover your head with your hands or a book or anything that you've got that you can cover. If possible, seek cover. Um, <clears throat> what you want to do though is be out of the line of fire because when we come in, all we're looking for is whoever the threat is. The threat is going to be hearing us coming in and we're probably going to become his new focus. So you want to get out of whatever crossfire is about to occur. Um, you want to remain still and once again don't resist being taken into custody or being removed. Um, you know, once we sort everything out, we'll, we'll treat you as, as a victim. If you're in a situation where you have to call 911 and this this applies to an active shooter and most of this applies to, to any type of call. Um, the things that we're going to be looking for, first and foremost, a building name and a room number. Um, if the call gets disconnected, if, if nothing else, we know where to go and we'll, we'll sort the rest out when we get there. That, the first piece of information we want to know is, is where are you and what's going on. After that, try to give us as much intelligence as possible because that's going to allow us to kind of formulate our plan on the way there. Um, we want to know how many suspects there are. We want a very detailed description. Um, you know, we, we train police to be, to be trained observers. That's, you know, to look for um, unusual characteristics, clothing description, hair, um, height, race, hair color, gender. Those are all things that, that we're going to be using to narrow down as people are flooding out. You know, if we see somebody matching the description, that's somebody who, who we're not going to pass by. So whatever you can provide as far as a description of the suspect, we will certainly welcome that. Um, we also want to know what type of weapons um, the shooter has, whether it's a handgun or a long gun. Um, the way we deal with somebody with a long gun is going to be very different from how we deal with somebody with a handgun because their capabilities are, are very different. Um, we want to know if, if there have been explosions or he's setting up some type of um, improvised explosive devices because they, they will bring those and set them up as booby traps to, to um, harm the, the people making entry. Um, we also want to know how many victims, uh, where the victims are, what type of injuries, um, because once the smoke clears and, and the shooter's been taken care of, we need to go to the people with the most serious injuries to, to start uh, a rescue effort. <coughs> A couple of general tips that, that you can apply to an active shooter or some other things um, is an emergency plan. And this kind of goes along with what a couple of you ask as far as questions. Um, this is a very individual um, endeavor, but you want, to, you want to have an emergency plan. You want to have an emergency plan for an active shooter, but you know, just like you should have an emergency plan when you're pumping gas or whenever you are you know, in a restaurant. Um, Basically, you just want to be, be prepared for something bad to happen. Um, you want to plan, plan uh, your escape routes. Um, we train police officers to, you know, when they go to a restaurant to eat, you know, they're going to sit with their back to the, to the wall where they can see the entrance, where the bad, you know, whatever threat would come in would come in. They're going to want to see the register. Um, you know, what they're going to be looking for is they're going to be seeing where the exits are in case they need to, to leave quickly. They're going to be looking for points of cover. Be looking for you know possible weapons of opportunity, um, but 
the the idea is to already have in your in your head an idea of what you would do if something were to happen. Um, pre pre plan for crisis scenarios. If if this happens, then then I would do this, and just just kind of have an idea of, of where you're going before you have to go there. You don't want to uh, face the the indecision or the delay that would come about trying to formulate a plan while while you're taking fire. You know, it's much more difficult to concentrate then. Um, know your limitations. If you're a track star, then maybe you can escape. Um, you know, if you're near the door. If you're on crutches and you're in the back of the room, odds are, you know, you're going to have to to think of something else to do. Um, look for weapons of opportunity. You know, you were talking about throwing things and. Um, if if you are facing death, you've got to you've got to really dig deep, and you know you're looking for that animal instinct to survive. If you have to um, bite somebody, if you have to you know take a pin out of your pocket and stab somebody in the eye, if you have to throw a desk, you know rip something up from the ground, you know use a laptop, whatever you have at your disposal is what you want to use to to save your own life. Um, but if you've already got an idea, okay, well, I see a couple things that, that I could use if something were to happen, then, then you're, you're one step ahead. We talk about seeking cover. Just to let you know, cover is very different from concealment. Concealment keeps somebody from seeing you. Cover keeps somebody from shooting you. So hiding behind a curtain is fine if he doesn't know you're there. If he knows you're there, then, then you're no better off than being in front of the curtain. Um, if you can get behind something like a solid oak desk or something like a pillar that's uh, reinforced with concrete or something that will actually stop bullets, now you're talking cover. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're, when you're uh, looking for where to, where to hide or flee to. Um, also keep in mind that cover beats concealment, but concealment beats nothing. So if, if you have no cover and all you have is you know, a little student desk, that's better than nothing. You know, maybe it'll deflect around. Um, from a from a small caliber gun, maybe um, you know it'll be it'll be enough that that he he overlooks you or something like that. So take what you can get, but if possible, seek actual cover, something that'll stop a run. If you're trying to flee and you're 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 running from the shooter and he's shooting at you, you don't want to run in a in a straight line. If if I'm standing here and you're running away from me shooting, I don't have to move the gun to to continue to shoot you. If you're running away. You know, you may be getting a little smaller, but you're really not changing. You know, that the trajectory of that round is going to continue to you as you run away, and the bullet will be going faster than you will be. So, what you want to do is run in a in a zigzag pattern, and what you're doing is a moving target is very difficult to shoot for most people. So, as you're running side to side, you know, you're probably going to be, you know, not worth the effort. So, um, and you're probably going to greatly, greatly increase your chances of not being hit. A um, little cartoon from the paper, Welcome to It Could Never Happen Here, USA, as the coroner and the SWAT team and everybody responds. Don't get in the mindset that it won't happen here. Don't think that this is only something that happens, you know, in, in the big cities or... Um, I could think of, of no more devastating place in the state of South Carolina for an active shooter to occur than, than here. I can probably think of no more likely place either, just because of our size. Um, you know, we're the largest uh, educational institution in the state, so, you know, if, if something happens in the state, odds are it's going to be here. So, you know, once you accept that, you can kind of prepare in your head for, for what you're going to do should it happen. Um, don't judge, yes? Forgive me for interrupting you. No, we absolutely. Do so, and I have another commitment elsewhere, I okay. believe. This is an embarrassing question that I'm going to pose anyway because... We think about these things. We think it could happen. And I think most of us feel a sense of responsibility for our students. They're all much younger than we are, and they're all there. I lecture in the hall that was about 300, and I'm closest to the emergency exit. Maybe you're not in a position to advise on this point, but do I dash for the exit? Have I perhaps told the students in advance at the beginning of the semester, here's, here's how we're going to handle this? Or... <laughs> Is, is, is the captain responsible? Um, that's something that, that's an individual decision. Um, it, 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 <laughs> if you look at Virginia Tech, uh, one of the faculty members that was killed, um, he was killed 
protecting his students. What he allowed, he basically used his body to barricade the door, which allowed his students to escape. Now, he was killed in the attack. Um, clearly, I mean, absolutely. I mean, he, he, he personally saved the lives of several of his students. I can add on what TJ is saying, uh, just in furtherance of your question. Uh, his comments about have a plan. You know, if you walk from your classroom or your office to your car in Bull Street Garage at night, part of that plan is where are the call boxes? Where's the best lighting for me to walk to get to my car? In your situation in a classroom, TJ's right. We can't say this is the blueprint for you. But you can create your plan by saying, I'm on the stage, there's only two doors in this 300 seat auditorium, there's a shooter in the back of the room, what's my best plan? You might save half of that classroom if you're the first out that door and call the police. I don't know. And that's why we can't tell you that's what you need to do. But what you do need to be working on is that plan. What's my environment, whether it's my office, whether it's this classroom, whether it's me walking to my car at night, uh, what is my plan? What, what's around me? What can I do? What can I utilize? Uh, what must I do to, to save a life? And that being said, you know, I, I would never try to tell you what, what is best for you. Um, if, you know, we clearly place more value on other people's lives than our own, or we would never respond to an active shooter. You know, our priorities of life have us a couple, <laughs> a couple ranks down, down the list. And that's just something that we accept because of the position that we have. Um, you know, so when we respond, you know, we are placing ourselves at risk in order to save someone else. But that, that's certainly not something that, that we would expect of anyone else. Yes, sir. Question to add to that. Um, in terms of faculty, um, this is somewhat of a personal question because I still today um, take classes with instructors that want to, um, which is understandable because it is annoying to hear vibrations from cell phones or to hear cell phones going off, but what is the administration doing to prohibit um, professors or encourage them not to require students to turn their phone completely on silent because if there was an emergency, how are they going to be notified if we have silence, silent cell phones? So I'm just curious about that. What are you guys doing? Because I know of several professors and several students that I know personally that have mentioned that their professors require silence of the cell phones. So I'm just curious. Um, I would say that's an issue that that would probably go to the provost office or the, the <coughs> president's office. Um, we certainly don't don't yeah. you know, dictate what what faculty do in their in their classrooms. The yes. majority of the phones phone 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 text message. So as long if I have mine on, then I can get a text message in, in my classroom. If you've registered your phone with us, then if, if something were to occur where we were to, to blast out a message, then, then you would receive it. Yes. Okay, following on to that young fellow's question, uh, you guys are installing this uh, outside PC system. Correct. Is there any plan for the future of linking that to the buildings themselves? Yes. There is? It will actually probably be linked to this one because... We have a tone alert radio which goes along with it and it has an output on the back. It can hook into a PA system. But those PA systems or audible systems are mainly set up on buildings that are greater than five stories. So this building would be one of them that would have. Yeah, because like when our fire alarm goes off, there's a voice override right. to it. So you yeah. can hook in and the voice over. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do want to play one real quick video for you. Um, you know, sometimes we get the question. You know, what does an active shooter look like? Well, an active shooter looks like your students. An active shooter looks like your coworkers. Um, you know, there have been cases of workplace violence. You know, it may not even be a shooter. It may, it may not be a student. It may not be someone affiliated with the university. It may be someone who wanders on. Um, but when you, when you look at someone, that could be, that could be the bad guy. Can I ask? Um, the video on... Just real quick, so in all these scenarios and the things that you've uh, outlined as possible reactions, what I notice is um, very apparent for its absence is there's no no recommendation to ever try to engage this person in conversation like you might if it was a hostage taker or some other kind of situation. So in all of these stories, there is there is no reason to try to talk to this person. Just this, no, this is not a this is not a hostage situation. This person is not borderline thinking about what their plan is. This person has already decided that 
their their plan is so mass murder. Even if they haven't shot anybody yet, but they walk in and they've got the gun, you should assume that that's the plan and proceed accordingly. That would be the safest thing to do. I would I would not attempt to. If we could bring the, the PowerPoint slide up real quick. I'm going to go I'm going to interrupt TJ. Please go ahead and start that. He's got a very interesting video here that requires no sound, but you can watch as we go ahead. Uh, we had this in a 2.30 to 3.30 time slot. We're just beyond 3.30. If there's anyone that must leave, uh, please feel comfortable to do so. But we're going to continue to go ahead. I'm going to introduce Elisa, uh, let her tell you a bit about BIT, and then we'll all three be here to take questions. We'll stay till 7, 8 o'clock tonight if you want us to. Uh, but we did want to give those who might have other commitments the opportunity to uh, to slip out. So, you got George? Yeah, okay. Uh, Oh, Recognize the dress on this young man. I mean, there's nothing unusual about him. Uh, he does not have a book bag either that we frequently see people with around the campus and, and see what he's able to conceal. Gosh. I'm going to introduce uh, Elise, Elisa. Excuse me. Uh, I think that we are extremely fortunate at the University of South Carolina because uh, so much of what I see, we're taking progressive, preventative steps uh, to, to a very serious problem. Here is one of the best preventative steps. I'm going, I'm going to let Lisa take over and tell you about this. Thank you. Um, my name is Elisa Cooney Liggett. I'm the Director of Judicial Affairs, and this is a bit of a shift because with the intensity of TJ's presentation, this is talking a little bit more about us attempting to um, prevent it and deal with students who may be going through a number of challenges. The behavioral intervention team is meant not just to address students who could become um, volatile, but the behavioral intervention team addresses students who have either had suicidal ideations, who have been hospitalized related to alcohol or drugs, or who have demonstrated what we call erratic behaviors, which is what we hope does not lead to a Cho situation. Um, thankfully, I'm here to report that the one that we see um, the most frequently is alcohol hospitalization, leaving erratic behavior as what we see the least. So while certainly I think that we're, we're feeling hypersensitive in this room because of the intensity of it, we rarely have students who really kind of make us go, I'm concerned about what I'm seeing because the student, you know, may be going off the deep end. So what I want to talk about, though, is if you do happen to have a student who's in that situation, what you may need to do. Um, First, though, the behavioral intervention team um, was created within the last year, and it is made up of not only folks from judicial affairs, but some of the administration in the police department who oversee all of the cops who are the street cops. I'm sure there's a much better name for that, Ernie. I apologize. Um, but essentially, our officers who are in the field dealing with students and who are most likely to be able to see a student who may be coming up on a radar for a particular reason. So that person's pretty plugged in. University housing is also on it because if a student's kind of coming up on a radar there, they are also there. And both the director and associate director of the counseling center are part of it. So we've tried to pull together the people who are most likely to know if something's going on. And so what we do is assess every single week any report that's come in to say what do we take with the student from this step. Um, what do you want to look for? Um, obviously if a student is making a threat or has a gun, don't make a bit referral. Call 911. <laughs> There's judicial affairs, a student is violating the code of conduct, and there's behavioral intervention. I'm seeing some things that are kind of disturbing, but I don't know for sure if it's a big deal, and so I want a professional committee to make that assessment. Two very different things. If you have a threat or you feel scared right then and there, please call 911. I want nothing about the BIT presentation to encourage you to go, I'm going to go through the most appropriate channel. No, call 911 if there's a threat. Now, there's a difference between a student who says, I have a gun, and a student who writes a disturbing journal entry that says, I'm considering purchasing a gun because I don't always feel safe in my apartment. You read that and go, huh? This student isn't necessarily posing a threat to you right then, but you're going, I don't feel real good about this. I'm not sleeping well at night. That's something to look for. Got this, you know, here's a quote. Got this disturbing journal entry. Wanted someone else to know about it. Um, something else that we look for, um, overhearing something. If you hear a student talking to another student and something about it to you strikes a chord and you know who the student is and the other student, we've had kind of some 
so, uh, two students in a classroom where the instructor felt that one student had a crush and was kind of doing the creepy stalker thing to the other and said, this might be kind of a bit referral. This student doesn't seem to be very in touch, so I'm going to make a referral. Um, here's the tough part. You're going to love me for this. There is no bright line. I wish I could say if it's this, if it's bit, and if it's this, it is not bit. What you want to do is if you feel fearful about something or you feel like something's up, because really this is kind of a gut decision, go ahead and make the referral because we can assess that in the team meeting and go, you know what, not necessarily a bit, but what we never want you to do is go, well, you know what, I had some weird feelings, so I'm not surprised that this student acted out and, you know, whatever happened. We'd much rather have you go, not sure, but just wanted to forward this so that someone else could take a look at it. What that means, though, is that you all and the BIT team have to have a pact. Please don't feel offended if we call you back and go, have you talked to the student about this, or this may not quite be a BIT. That's not but because we don't think that you're a good person or you're making appropriate bit referrals. That just means we've got to assess them on a case-by-case -case basis. We had a student who um, came through as a bit referral because she had planned her own funeral. She talked about what kind of coffin she had. She had a lot of kind of erratic behaviors and people were going, this is strange. And so we said, well, if you don't mind, ask her. You know what, some students have brought this to my attention. It's a little different than what I've heard. I'm kind of concerned about it. Tell me about it. Turns out she worked at a funeral home. And so she, yeah, and now we can laugh. At first, we're all holding our breath because that's fair. We don't know what the outcome will be. So sometimes we may go, if you don't mind and you're not fearful of the student, it's just kind of strange, go ahead and ask them about it so that we have more information before we go through the entire bit process. If you feel fearful, communicate to that to us too. We're not certainly wanting to put you in any position that you feel compromised in. Um, another thing to look for, I think we have... We have people post some disturbing things on Facebook, so I don't know if you have Facebook groups in your classes, but if a student says, saw this on a classmate's Facebook posting and, you know, feel like it's disconcerting, feel free to forward something like that. Um, what happens once we get those is that we all meet together and we make a decision. If it is going to be a student who qualifies for a behavioral team intervention, what we do is send them through a four-week assessment or four-session assessment with the counseling center. So our counseling center, I can't say enough about because they've devoted this much of their therapist time to go on. If there's a student who's on people's radar and we're fearful of what they may do, there are four specific assessments. And this is off a of, um, another program where they've been able to limit suicides based on a four session assessment. So they will be mandated to go through that so that a licensed therapist in our counseling center can go what's going on and decide if there's some need for additional treatment. If a student says, hey thanks, forget you guys BIT team, I'm not going to do this, that's why me as Director of Digital Affairs comes into play. Then I go, uh-huh. Now you have a charge for failure to comply. So certainly not every student is willing to go for counseling. So what we do is, the background is, if you don't want to do that, then you're going to come through Judicial Affairs and we're going to try to address some of your behaviors that way. Most students are more than willing. A lot of them, that's kind of been their cry for help. They've been kind of reaching out and someone says, something doesn't seem right right now, or you notice some drastic change in their behaviors and you're concerned, what we may do, we might get that bit report and go, thank you so much for reporting this. We're just going to forward this to the counseling center because it sounds like there might be an intervention there, but the student isn't necessarily a threat to anyone. So <clears throat> once you make that report, that entire team assesses it and reads everything you've got. Or we may go back to you and ask you any further questions that we need in order to make an assessment. And then if we decide this student qualifies, we have that four session intervention. And if not, we may just, there are a lot of different resources that we can use. We can have folks in housing check up on them. We can kind of talk them into counseling if there's somebody that they know. Um, so there are a lot of different nuances to this. And again, it's not necessarily that we have a lot of folks who we intend are going to be active shooters. It's typically students who have just hit um, a crisis that they didn't intend on and are having difficulty kind of working through that. Um, yeah, I know you guys all want to be on the BIT team and try to predict what this person's future behaviors may be. 
it's impossible. So please know that we're, we're kind of doing this the best we can, just like you're going, I don't know what this person's future behaviors are, and that's why I want to make this report. Um, the other part of the BIT process that I hope you guys appreciate is that once you make that referral, perhaps it is a person that we say, this person really needs an intervention. We're so glad that you made this referral. What we can't do is call you back and go, yeah, he is in a serious manic phase and he is off his meds. Whoo, thank God. Obviously, HIPAA protects what they say in those sessions. So sometimes we'll get instructors call back and go, so um, Elisa, whatever happened with that student? Nine times out of ten, some part of that record is federally protected and I can't tell you and I wish I could. And you're going to go, gosh, well, I followed my part of the process. Why haven't you followed yours? I can't. I would tell you anything that I'm able to tell you that's not federally protected. So please know that if, though, I can't tell you, that might be a really good sign that that student is now in counseling because that's the part that I can't tell you. They, the counseling center can't even tell me, as one of the BIT team members, what the student is saying in those sessions. So certainly, there's, we're all sitting there going, thank goodness for the referral because it looks like this was a perfectly appropriate one. Yes, ma'am don't want to go in for the four sessions, then they mm -hmm. would be referred to Judicial Affairs, so we would yes, know if they had turned down counseling. Um, I'd probably tell you that. Because as an advisor, that's mm -hmm. something that's been very disconcerting, is that mm -hmm. if, I, if I advise a student to go across the street to get counseling, yeah. I can't know whether they in fact follow through and do it, right. even if I call up and make the appointment for them. Mm -hmm. they you know, can't I can't tell you. know that that happens right. without doing things that supposedly breach HIPAA, and yet, mm -hmm. as an advisor, I feel like I'm breaching my role as an advisor not to be sure they get the help that they need. Yeah, they can't even tell parents. I don't know if that makes you feel any better. Um, but <laughs> um, Now, of course, they can't tell you unless it's, if you make a BIT referral, then, you know, we, we certainly want to honor the fact that you've been a good partner in that, so we will do the best we can without, you know, absolutely breaching someone's confidentiality. Yes, sir? How do we contact you or make a referral? Oh, that's my next step. Why, thank you. You're perfect segue. www.se.edu, you all are aware of. Forward slash bit. That will take you to the bit homepage. On the bit homepage, something, one of the toolbars is incident report. And what it's going to ask you for is the student's name, social security number. If you don't have all of that information, that's okay. And then it's going to ask you for a commentary on what happened and what's concerned you. Once you hit send, that incident report goes to all five of the main members of the BIT team immediately. That way, if I'm out of my office doing this presentation and someone says, hey, got this going on, the other members of the BIT team are there to receive it. So that's done very purposefully. Um, and so... Once that happens, if, if it's right before the meeting, we'll deal with it at the meeting. If it's very emergent, we will probably call you and get some more details. But once you hit submit on that, you can kind of breathe a breath of fresh air that it's in the hands of five professionals who are all going to shoot emails back and forth on what's our next step. Mm -hmm. So you've almost washed your hands of it, believe it or not, at that point, unless we have some follow-up questions. And then we'll take it from there. Yes, sir. <coughs> Most faculty in my part of the College of Arts and Sciences, mm -hmm. I know very well, they do not directly encounter often you guys. They come to me first. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that we could make it so that they feel more comfortable, knowledgeable, whatever, to act on their own? Mm -hmm. for do you want me to come to your faculty meeting? Could do that. I could do that. Could do that. Yeah. But we don't have them. You know that often, and I can't tell you about the numbers that show up at faculty meetings. <laughs> oh, yeah. But if if we could, I, I just want to make sure that that if I can get a source of information to send out all the folks that I interact with, it mm -hmm. might be helpful in getting more immediate responses as opposed to send me an email and then say you know here you should do something, and I then I have to go and find out these things. And mm -hmm. there may be some immediacy to this that is mm -hmm. that needs to be dealt with directly by them since they're the ones that are seeing the behavior, and I think they're reluctant to do that. What's a good way to get out the, even if they just have access to the BIT instant report? Hmm. I mean, if they knew that they were empowered to do that, and someone oh, don't even want to get involved. This has to do with all kinds of things about student behavior, not mm -hmm. just not just. We that. have students right. make referrals regarding other people on their residence halls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. So we're looking for, because that's why the folks who are on the BIT team, 
including Deputy Director Grabsky, we're looking for the folks who are in the field and who are right there. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, let, me, um, let me talk to you later about how to, how to get this out so that people feel more comfortable. I would love to. Sir. Alicia oh, I'm and sorry. I apologize because I got a question for everybody but you. <laughs> um, is the, are your PowerPoints available anywhere? Um, I can email them to you before. Um, okay, well, I've got your email. I'll, okay. I'll query you in that regard. Second thing is you'd mentioned the alert um, exercise that was coming up. Uh, are you all planning any exercises for the campus itself that would be conducted during the semester and thus, you know, potentially disrupt classes? Not something that would disrupt classes, but we are planning an exercise through the emergency management team. Okay, and uh, we're down here in sunny South Carolina, and, you know, South Carolinians firmly believe in escalation. So, have you guys discussed, you know, in your, at your level, maybe something out of Osborne to tell faculty and staff not to, you know, potentially bring weapons on campus and the like because of these incidents that are happening? It's currently against the law to have a weapon on campus unless you are a police officer. So are we sending anything out to remind people of that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, all you got to do is walk through Pendleton Garage and look at how many gun racks are in there, and they ain't students. So, you know. As far as sending anything out, I'm not aware of it. I'll be happy to make an inquiry. Uh, I know that the question has been asked uh, by faculty, staff, employees, can I bring my gun to work? I've got a gun permit. The president has strictly upheld no. There are no weapons on campus, and he is the only person by law who can authorize someone other than a law enforcement officer sure. to have a weapon on campus. Well, I just think it might be a good idea to remind folks. And, you know, if you didn't want to send me to a fit team referral, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> we don't need any more business, so Thank you. Let me make two quick comments, I'm going to get to your question. Um, Please know, I think that probably the biggest fear that people have when they make a bit referral is, is the student feeling um, like they're going to injure me? HIPAA exceptions are, if a student threatens himself or others, then that therapist has a duty to warn. So please know, if that student does indicate that he is going to harm the instructor who made this report, which never has happened before, thank you, or harm the instructor, which has never happened before, that you would be notified, and I think that that at the core is what people are concerned about, and so know that that is um, one of the caveats. And also the other, the difficult part of this is that please know as you walk out, people with mental illnesses are not prone to rampages. I think it's difficult when you see something like this to go, oh my gosh, one of my students, you know, is bipolar, I sh I'm automatically nervous. Please don't feel that way. That stigma, I think, is already a difficult one to combat, and so certainly because these very few limited tragedies have happened does not mean that all the students that we serve with mental illness have um, a propensity for this. Ma'am. If I, if I send a student to you, mm -hmm. what are the possible outcomes? Counseling or not? Counseling or judicial affairs. Okay, but then if you send back to me they didn't have counseling, then you're telling me what they did have. I mean, if you send back to me... I've, I've got to, really I'm, I'm sorry, I know this is a really important question. No, it's not. There <laughs> is there, there is a is a class that's going to be recorded in ten minutes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So we do so we've got to the uh, thank the speaker please. And if, if y'all would like to, to continue this conversation in the hallway, please please uh, we, the, the evaluation forms are important, so if you could fill this out, we'd appreciate it. No, they don't. Say it again.